Thomas Westbrook here, and you're watching Atheist Edge. What he's really going after is that doctrine of inerrancy. And that's something I, you know, that's where I lean, that's where I come from. Um, but I understand the complexities of it, and not all my Christian friends agree with me, case in point, right? So you don't, you don't have to be an inerrantist. Uh, in order to be able to believe that there is some reliable historical information in the Gospels. And, and Bart, I think, is like attacking this, thinking that now the whole thing falls. But it's interesting that even Bart says that even if you buy what he's saying about the Gospels, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're not a Christian. And uh, because a lot of his friends, they're very aware of everything he's talking about, still believe Christianity is true. He's really going after pretty much this this uh, Christian subset of, of scriptural inerrancy. So you don't still believe in inerrancy, do you? And that there's no errors? We need a definition. Well, I mean, that's like, like or infallibility that's that capable. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're, uh, you've grown from that, right? I don't have to <laughs> believe that every word in the Bible is exactly literally true. No. You're not far from the kingdom, I <laughs> 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 uh, so I'm saying. That's not, that's not really an issue. Now, um, we're going to go ahead and uh, get into this next session here. And one of the things that came up, which um, I, I think, and uh, Jim, and all, I, I, I became revisiting this whole situation with Jim Hall and on my on uh, Facebook, and, and uh, Brady got into a, a very interesting discussion. And a very nice discussion, too. It's almost like, this doesn't even sound like the internet. But um, uh, about the issue of, of uh, was, was the gospel account off by 10 years? Or they did, was, there, was there a one-decade error on, on this? I, I, I asked uh, Brady, because this is the same thing Bart Ehrman brings up in his yeah. book. And so I asked him if he would take all the information that you, and, that you two were working on and try to get it down to like five or six minutes to where we all can get a picture of what the issues are here. So, right. Jim and I were uh, were roasted on Facebook for not for being too nice to one another. It was like, can somebody please call someone the name? But what I want to share with you is something that caught my eye because Jim and I had this conversation about Quirinius and Herod uh, and his governorship of the area of Syria, and uh, and it really surprised me because as I went through this. Uh, and we started having this discussion, I went through and noticed that there's actually been some, um, I mean, very serious uh, evidence showing that Phineas was indeed uh, the governor of Syria, or co-governor of Syria during this time. And it's, it's not even like a little bit of, of evidence, it's like etched in stone evidence. And so uh, this really blew my mind. So I'm going to show you this, and, and I'm just going to say this up front, it's like a 30,000 foot. There are so many layers to this that... If you want to dig deeper, just let me know, and I can uh, point you to the resources. Uh, they're all online, and they're all free, because the books are, are past their copyright date, so you can throw it up there for free. But this is what uh, Ehrman said in this book. He said, if the Gospels are right, that Jesus' birth occurred during Herod's reign, then Luke cannot also be right that it happened when Quirinius was the governor of Syria. We know from a range of other historical sources, including the Roman historian Tacitus, the Jewish historian Josephus, and several ancient inscriptions, that Quirinius did not become the governor of Syria until 6 CE, 10 years after the death of Herod. And now, we all agree uh, that Quirinius was governor of Syria in 6 CE. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's all kinds of evidence for that. But we have to ask the question, what about before? And this brings us to the work of Sir William Ramsey. He was a uh, 20th century archaeologist, uh, New Testament scholar, and it's the work he did in Antioch Pisidian where he discovered actually just a village uh, near Antioch Pisidian, uh, a couple of inscriptions. This is the first one. This was photographed by his wife in 1913 and was the base of a statue that was put up in honor of a military victory uh, commanded by uh, Quirinius. And this is, this is what it says. Now, I'm just going to point out just the uh, highlighted stuff here that's important is this is a little bit of like his resume. So you have uh, the uh, the chief of engineers, which that is a, that's not really a title of any kind of authority. It, it was not a really big job. Um, but this next line is really important because it says, Prefect Quirinius uh, Duomavir. Uh, now, what's important about this is that, uh, well, let me just give you the, the definition here. Uh, a duumvir in ancient Rome 
each of two magistrates or officials holding a joint office. So what this is telling us is that he held a joint office with who? Servilius. Well, what do we when we look at the uh, when we look at the textbooks when we look at the history behind who was governor during 6 BC? We always find Servilius. So here we have etched in stone uh, proof that Quirinius was a uh, co-governor, if you will, uh, in the region of Syria. Now the next part is important where it says at the state's expense because, and I won't go through the long story on this, but this goes to show you when the dating happened. Now there's a second inscription that was found as well, and this, this gives us even more information to understanding how do you go from chief of engineers to being the governor or co-governor of Syria. Well, we see that he was in charge of this tribune of soldiers and the Bosporan cohort. So now we see that he's leading this same, um, he, he's leading this army that defeats a regional enemy that was a constant thorn in the side of the Romans. So he's, you know, he's kind of a, the, the local hero, if you will, and you can see how that brings them up uh, in that respect. Now, uh, and of course, you see the same things um, with the Dumavir, uh, the, uh, or the Duumvir, and then uh, Servilius' his name again. Uh, there's a third name that would have been really interesting, though, but the inscription cuts off there. Now, we have to ask the question, when were these inscriptions made? Well, when we look at the archaeologists from that time, they date it around 10 to 7 B.C., which fits very nicely if, uh, if Luke is correct. But just to show you that, that um, you say, well, these guys may be biased. Uh, William Ramsey uh, was at one point a skeptic. I don't know when he, uh, when he turned to be a, a Christ follower or not. But just to give you an idea, somebody who denies that Jesus even existed, Richard Carrier, is even willing to date this somewhere between 11 uh, B.C. to 1 B.C. So it, there's really no argument whatsoever about these inscriptions being old. Now there's one other area, and this is something that, that, uh, that Jim had brought up that he was concerned about, and I thought that he made a good point about it. And so I looked in a little bit further, and looking at the region of uh, where... Uh, Quirinius was at. Now there's some other issues that pop up in terms of Tertullian. Uh, he, uh, he states that uh, Saturninus was governor of Syria from 96 to BC, but the problem is is that uh, that's not very helpful because he was actually out between 8 to 7 BC and the enrollment in Palestine was delayed until the summer or autumn of 6 BC. So um, when we look at this, we're finding just more and more evidence that lines up because who followed in that position? Well, we know now that it was both Servilius and uh, Quirinius in this role. Now, at the next though, going back to, to um, Jim's concern was the issue of, wait, hold on, he was doing a lot of his leading of this army in Galatia which and is even, 300 miles away. Yeah, well, I mean, you can see right here on the map, in fact, uh, let me zoom in a little bit. Um, now, what's important Syria. to see here is all that yellow area. That This is a map of what the Roman Empire looked like during the time in question. And you can see how far Syria uh, comes over. In fact, Cilicia, uh, which is right at the edge of the green and the blue, was during that period was referred to as Cilicia Syria. And so... Uh, to see this, that he, he wasn't a uh, long way away. In fact, that there were times very much that he was actually in the uh, area of Syria. And you can dig in a little bit deeper and even, uh, you can even find the division of, of responsibilities during this time. Because that was my personal question was, well, how do you have two governors? I mean, I mean can you imagine that? I mean, like, how does that work? Well, you dig in a little bit deeper and you find out that, no, it's, it's really not hard to believe at all. Whenever you start looking at the division, there's no way that one guy could have handled uh, leading the army, leading the military, and then the other guy keeping uh, the local state affairs over. So it seems that uh, not only was Luke correct, but Luke was very precise in what he showed us. But that takes me back to Bart Ehrman for just a moment. Because the big question I have to ask is when, you know, I mean, this took a little bit of work, but it didn't take a lot of work. And so I'm left thinking, you know, Bart Ehrman's a great scholar. I mean, uh, you know, Bill says he's like one of 24 guys and or 24 scholars in the whole world. I mean, is it possible that Jim and I know something about the New Testament that Bart Ehrman doesn't know? 
I mean, is, is there a possibility that, that Bart has never seen William Ramsey's No, I would say work? assume everything you know, he knows. Yeah. And why didn't he say so? <laughs> but that brings us yeah. to the point. Or best case scenario, Brady just broke new ground, and that's <laughs> a bullet against mythicism. <laughs> well, it's possible. It's not so much that I broke new ground. I mean, this is a hundred years not, old. Not, so, I mean, this hmm? stuff isn't, I mean, mythicism. it's been around a long time. But this is an so, argument for mythicism. Is, is he the wild disagreement? Is he unaware of this information, or is he conveniently ignoring it? And again, just throwing this out to you know, uh, no offense to our co college freshmen here, but throwing out to a group of freshmen uh, or a populace who um, maybe doesn't take the time to study these things. And I think, or he's got an agenda. It, yeah, or he, yeah, or he has an agenda. Uh, motive. Do you think uh, it's common in academia not to be dishonest, but to Select the information that fits your thesis. Well, I think that's dishonest. I, I, I mean, I, think, I just don't but know how I think common that is. Human nature, you know? and I, it's something I don't think that it you have to fight against. Much weight, though. I have to. Oh, so many of us don't have to fight against that. That's the point of pure. But, but but when when you when you give into okay. it, you that's realize true. you've done something wrong, right? Don't I mean? Don't you? You realize? I mean, I can win an argument with a Mormon with something that's not true, but I I, I, I have done something wrong when I've done that. Yeah, I, I hesitate to say this because I like Bill a lot and I don't want him to hate me. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> He'll get over it. He's got but see, er, earlier you asked, you know, what is his motivation? And I think Art Ehrman has carved out a niche. It's a really good niche. Mm -hmm. It's a best-selling author to skeptical people. And, and I Christians, think he's like going to, to create a commodity that's going to be successful in that area, and sometimes that means using material that he may not even believe. I have a whole different issue with this. Had it not been on the odd, I'm just going to assume that there's not God in providence for a moment. The odd coincidence that a hundred years ago we find this inscription, we'd all be still saying total contradiction, mm -hmm. just because we can't find an inscription. Well, it's like the critics of Isaiah saying that uh, our, our, our oldest extant copy is like 800 A.D. or whatever it was, and there's no way that that wasn't late dated and changed to fit the Christian narrative. Isaiah 53. Until you have the great Isaiah scroll that predates Christianity, yeah, yeah. which is part of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Yeah. So it, it, and I got to see that when you did too, when you were in Isaiah. It's yeah. incredible. Yeah. So, but it's, it's, um, Again, you being a Christian, I think, is, is, is God just doing that so he gets a laugh off of it or something? Or is it how many other of these apparent really difficult contradictions, we just haven't found the inscription yet. So I would say I would be agreeing with Bart if it was 100 years ago, but it's not 100 years ago. And, and I just feel like he's got access to this information more than I do. So to put a bow on what are you saying, you got more, I'm sure, but just to put a bow on what he said so of thus far is... Um, so at the end, it wrapped up with me conceding and tentatively accepting everything he just said. You repented in dust and ashes. Yep. Yep. Exactly. He that changed. He changed my mind on it. Right, but it just means that's no. not. It still leaves right. open one little thing. I mean, it doesn't take away from any of this, but it still leaves open the fact uh, that we still need to dig deeper. We we'll probably need to do this next: is dig deeper into the actual how censuses are done back then, and do you have to go to the homeland of your how many yeah. generations back? Yeah. Because that's a big question mark. Bill. You know, go, having to go to Bethlehem sounds kind of fishy to me. Well, what were you saying, Courtney? Question. Is, so, is this, is his uh, research not peer reviewed? Uh, well, but this is popular work. work. This is popular scholarly work. work. And, that, and that's where my <coughs> complaint is. And yeah, that's, a, that's because, because that, in his popular books and yeah. his scholarly books. Yeah, he, he is peer reviewed, and that's what I was oh, absolutely asking. absolutely, he is. Absolutely. No, on, on what? On this? Well, well, like he was a New Testament his, scholar. He wrote misquoting Jesus for the popular audience, The Orthodox Corruption of Scripture, which is a real that scholarly bit. book, which talks about, and this is very nuanced and difficult, uh, these textual things he's talking about, but obviously peer-reviewed. Uh, yeah, yeah, so this is what he, I was asking real Tim McGrew about. Yeah. I said, Tim, is any more careful in his works that are for scholarly audiences? And, he's, mm. it, and you heard his answer to that, you know. Tim said... Yeah, Somewhat because he knows who've been called, but he still makes these type of errors. Hmm. But it's like still you have Luke trace the genealogy back to Adam. And Jim was saying, I was saying the first homo sapiens was 100,000. Jim 
corrects me and says, no, it's 300,000. Well, even more ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, whether it's 100 or 300,000, you know, this is just him making stuff up, just like Matthew has 14 uh, genealogies, then he goes to David, then he goes 14 to Abram. They're just trying to, you know, well, honestly, and Juliet Chronicles is a million things he left out. So well, this honestly, is not I'm... fact, it's fictional. These narratives are fiction. Well, I mean, the honestly, slaughter of the innocents. Why doesn't Luke mention the slaughter of the innocents? Bill, 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 let's take one thing at a time. Gish Gallup. What did you call that? Gish Gallup. I don't follow you. Gish Gallup. You try to hit him with so many questions that they can only answer one of them. Matthew does it from Adam through... Luke does Adam. And nobody believes that... Luke does it from Adam, and Matthew does it from Abraham. Don't say one's Mary and one's Joseph. You can't trace genealogy back to the first time with Sapiens since he was at least... As Jim says, 300,000 years old. Oh, Matthew. 300,000 years. Now, whether it was true or not, Matthew said, no, we have we have records of those people back to... There's yeah, I don't believe that. Yeah. I mean, I don't I mean, believe... Young, I, don't know, I don't know if that's right or not, but I don't see what the issue is. But, but if your concern is that the Messiah has to come through this line of people... And that's a royal pedigree. If you understand, to this day, Jewish life is centered around the Messiah coming back. You can't even be considered Jew and move to Israel unless you can prove it genealogically. But the whole thing is insane anyway since... Joseph was it, not Jesus' father. The Holy Spirit was. Finally, you agree with us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so getting back to the census for just a second, I, I appreciate the info. I've never heard that before. But, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious, and I, I, I can't cast any doubts in the research because it's the first time hearing it. But, you know, I, I've heard this argument about the 10 year gap from. Yeah other people besides Irvin from mm -hmm. atheists from all stripes. And I've never heard this counter-argument from any Christian apologist. And by your own admission, it's very easy to find. Yeah. Like, any idea well, I mean, like, why, like, if this is such an obvious well, thing, why? Well, sometimes it's lazy scholarship. Some will try to say, um, they'll point back to the Greek, because the word protos uh, can mean um, first or before. And so they said, no, 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 it's, it's just before Corinthians was yeah, governor. But you can't make that argument. Really. But, but that's not a good argument. It's not a good argument. That's not good from the Greek. It's not good. The grammar. The, word, the, the definition of the word, you can get away with it, but not the grammar. So yeah. you're saying Christians were some Christians? Oh, yeah, yeah. There, yeah, there's and a lot out there. Like, mm -hmm. So that they don't have to and go so, through this word. Yeah, exactly. and so, you know, they probably just didn't do real great in Greek class, you know. Uh, but, um, or they're being dishonest. So... Uh, another another one will say this, which I think is, is wrong also, because the Greek is saying that he was uh, in this level of authority in Syria during this time. They'll say, well, you know, it's kind of like uh, it's kind of like when they when they you know built the highway. You know, I mean, they they started the planning, but they weren't done until 30 years later. And so, you know, they started this uh, here in, in 9 B.C. It, but he's talking about. Uh, no, but you know they finished it in six A.D. But that's not even right because Acts and Acts Luke talks about Corinius's six A.D. census, and so you can't point to that one either. And so uh, those are. That's why I said you know like who you know what what are you wanting to present us? I'm just wanting to present to you the truth. And the truth uh, is, Brady, that there was no universal census where someone goes back a thousand years to where their grand. Their ancestor was. Well, Nobody it, believes that. Yeah, it doesn't quite say that. <coughs> but, um, they <coughs> said it goes back to their ancestors. Yeah, but, the Romans well, well, you, you want to have to break on that because I've just done a lot of research on this, and I'm telling you that there is not just a little, but there's ample evidence that they were to go back to an ancestral homeland. A thousand years? I didn't say, well, I don't nobody said that in the text. Yeah. What did it say, 1,000 and not 800 or 500? Whatever. Well, I mean, Joseph had to go back to the home of his ancestor David, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which, so would be where his family Yeah, which would be where his family And I don't friend. know about that. I mean, oh, yeah. everybody would be going he, all over the place. Of, the Romans the were very the pragmatic. Day. They, you know, were, mm -hmm. you know, good at uh, collecting taxes and running their... Sure. That, that would have just been a mess. Why don't we do this? Why, why don't we let this census thing be a discussion of a... Yeah. And by the way, for yeah, those sure. who don't know, every other, every other Thursday we get together for... Uh, just an open discussion over at Hooligans, which pub about a block from here, and um, it's, um, I mean, we talk about a lot of things besides, like, this issue, so we'll talk about politics, religion, everything that you're not supposed to talk about. It is fun. It's a fun, 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 it's a fun
It'll be a week from this Thursday. It, it's from 4 to 8, but come as much as you want to. So you come for 15 minutes, you stay for an hour, stay for 30 minutes, stay for the whole time if you want. But people come and go during that time. And we had a celebrity with us. Um, Alec Jules was actually there. Um, how many of you know who that is? Okay, do that. But he's a, he's a really, you know, I, I believe pretty well known. Huh? Alex. Alex. Is that Alex Jules? Alex Jules. He says, spell Alex with an I. So, Courtney, what's his, pronounced like an e. what's his claim to frame, Alex? Um, he's a... He's, a founder he's, of, he's one of the founders of FOF. He yeah. also is the leader of a black uh, non-believers. Yeah. yeah, he's the president. Mm -hmm. uh, Regular on pay, uh, pay phone. Pres he writes president, for Patheos president and of Ebony. Yeah, but, um, no, he's not president anymore. But his, he's just very well researched with uh, blogging and with debating... He's, uh, oh, he's doing a Bible of Your Consortium. Really? He's on the next yeah. BBC. He's on the next one. On the 28th. On is Christianity the best um, solution for racism, something like that. Is it a, yeah. is it a discussion, a dialogue? Like, debate. Yeah, it's oh, debate. Yeah. yeah I, I, forgot the name yeah. Of, I forgot the name of the pastor, but it's him and a pastor. He doesn't matter, though. Yeah, it's not the much. famous one, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't, know what? I don't know if he's famous, but I, I know he's well known. Like, like Brady. <laughs> Back to this, okay. Let it I believe the birth narrative is fiction, but it's even worse is the passion, the trial of Jesus. And obviously, uh, Pilate was a ruthless uh, ruler. He uh, would go and uh, beat up Jews. He, just, he insulted them. He would have never let Bar Barabbas free. And the reason he did was when Mark was writing the story, he goes, oh my gosh, I'll just go and rearrange that story where they let the scapegoat free. That would be Barabbas, and Jesus would be the right. pure man. Right. And Roman, here's the Roman history tells us another story. No, here's what Roman history, history says: <laughs> is that Rome pulled uh, Pilate from Jerusalem because he was too ruthless for Rome? Can you believe that? I mean, that would have never happened. Okay. He would thank, you for, thank you for making our point. Yeah, that's, yeah, that would be our point, which is against it. Yeah, that you get pulled out of your position. Whenever you don't please the people, when you don't appease the people, so he was, he so he would oh, do I things mean, like this. No, he Otherwise, he he's going to lose his position. And in Rome, they are ruthless, right? Just, so a lot of times, like you lose it, your position, you lose your life. It's not always that. Talking about etched in stone until fairly recently, Pontius Pilate was a fictional character. Yeah, it was sixty years ago. Fifty years ago, until at the Caesarea Maritime, they found yeah, we're going to have that conversation. We're finding stuff all the time. That this is not a fictional thing, this made up whole cloth um, out of nothing. Not, not, none of this proves that it's true <laughs> or that it's 100% accurate or 50% accurate. Mm -hmm. but, but admittedly, the time to believe something is when that <coughs> evidence comes up, not because you think that someday but, they'll find it. But you don't want to also believe it's well, not absence true. Of uh, absence of evidence. Absence of evidence is not an absence, it's not proof that something is not true. Yeah. <laughs> right, but you believe. Like, like gravity. Yes. Well, we have evidence. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now. Um, but his point is now. But the whole I mean, trial of Jesus, down. it was at night. There are so many things wrong with that. that yeah. It just, it's clear that it's, am I right, Chris, that it's just, you know, made up? I, I, I think Kim agrees with some good, easy, not complicated issues. Everyone here, and I can do that if you can switch over here. Kim agrees. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Kim agrees. 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 There Not Tim McGraw. No, yeah. that's oh, we, Tim McGraw. We, we, we don't we don't want to hear Tim McGraw's, McGraw's thoughts on this. He <laughs> <laughs> can absolutely be. Actually, Tim McGraw is a very can absolutely be evidence of that. Yes, it can be. It's not good evidence, but it is evidence. Ah, there we go. But you just said evidence of absence. No absence of evidence can sometimes be evidence of absence. If yeah. We have never seen a unicorn ever. That's good evidence that there are no unicorns. Doesn't mean there aren't any. We can find one in the Amazon jungle. Can you slide back in? I'm just glad I didn't have any. He flipped it. Right. He flipped the narrative, yeah. Yeah, that's why I was laughing. Yeah, I've never heard anybody say that like that. Yep. You've never mm -hmm. seen a unicorn, so I'm going to choose to believe in unicorns. That's, yeah. While we're doing that, I'm looking at Luke 2, 
Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. Why is that controversial? Because he probably won. He just probably made it up. Do, do you realize, are we, though, are we also ignoring the fact that this is one know? book and Matthew doesn't talk about any of this at all? Yeah, it is exactly. Bethlehem. Also, is, is it based on an earlier version of it? Because if we're looking at, like, the King James, then that's going to be a prettier package of what the scripture is. It is an assumption, but it, but it, but meaning that like we can't assume that it's not. You well, know just what I mean? real quick, Mary makes a hundred mile journey from Bethlehem or from Galilee. But there's no way on oh, a donkey on foot. It doesn't matter. Yeah, pregnant woman is not going to make it. Yeah, yeah. 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 that's right. We have to go back and look at the older. Yeah. The older manuscripts, the, the oldest things we got. The difference, like, like, you know, the difference between English versions and other versions is... We have older scaling. manuscripts, the yeah, actual hard. Yeah. We can go back and look at them. The, co the Codex, uh, uh, so I like your point, but when you say, well, obviously, oh, you're you're on on uh, that kind of, that's really... That's a pretty broad I assumption. You on that, have, you, have you known pregnant women that have... Done but I kind of have to go with Bill though because somebody told me <laughs> somebody told me I had a pregnant woman like eight months pregnant and we were just trying to donkey for like eight months like what I don't know how is that I would call him BS on that too just on uh, principle. Uh, I would, I would say that, that, you know, He's that, a very objective person. You know, My name is James Walker, and I'm president of Watchman Fellowship and an apologetics, Christian apologetics ministry focusing on new religious movements uh, called the occult, giving Christian answers to those uh, who are not of the Christian faith. And I'm also co-founder of a group called the Atheist Christian Book Club, along with the other co-founder, Bill Cluck. And what we are is we're a, uh, a monthly gathering of Christians and atheists, um, 15 to 30 of us, uh, about half and half Christians and atheists, and we alternate books. We'll do a Christian book and then a, an atheist book and get in some very intense dialogue, but very friendly, uh, very respectful dialogue on that. And our, our upcoming book is going to be Jesus Interrupted by Bart Ehrman, uh, a former evangelical Christian, now agnostic, uh, perhaps one of the most uh, prominent uh, critics of the New Testament today, I would say, popular uh, critics of the New Testament. Uh, joining me today for the interview is my friend Tim McGrew, who holds a Ph.D. in philosophy from Vanderbilt and is currently chairs the philosophy department at Western Michigan University in Kalamazoo. Tim, thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me on. Well, uh, tell me a little bit about, uh, I know you've, you've uh, been on radio interviews with, uh, with Bart Ehrman. Tell me about how do you know Bart Ehrman? Yeah, so I first encountered Bart, of course, through his books. In fact, it was through this very book, Jesus Interrupted, that I first became interested in his popular work. I had looked at some of his scholarly work that grew out of his dissertation, but uh, it's, it's a kind of a fun story how it happened. I was talking in a coffee shop with a young woman who's an adult convert, lovely young woman, and she confessed to me that just after she had become a Christian, she was so excited to learn more about Jesus she ran down to the library to try to find a book about Jesus. And she pulled the first book off the shelf that she saw the word Jesus in the title. You guessed it, it was Jesus Interrupted. Yeah. <laughs> and she said, uh, she started to read it and she just got more and more perplexed and, and didn't know what was going on. And so she put it back on the shelf, but she confessed that she had felt kind of guilty about that. So I said to her, Look, I've, I own a copy of that book. Let's meet here in the coffee shop. Go get that copy. Bring it. I'll meet you every week. Uh, we can meet for an hour and a half every week. I'll block out the time. Ask anything. Start anywhere. And we will keep going until you have a satisfied mind. And so we did. We met for oh, several months and talked about sections. And at first she was very timid. She was like, well, he, he says this here. Uh, but after a few weeks, there was a change, and it was kind of a wonderful thing, and she began coming in with more confidence, and she'd say, okay, he says this, so the first thing we're going to do is read the text for ourselves, and so we, we had a very good time there, and I'm 
pleased to say that it completely cured her doubts that had been uh, created by reading some of Bart's book. I'm going to ask you some questions about the book in a minute, but uh, just to let you know, uh, uh, we usually have the author of whatever book we're dealing with that comes in for a video greeting at this time uh, uh, to kind of answer some of our questions about the book. And uh, uh, usually we have that. Uh, we did make contact with, uh, with Dr. Ehrman uh, to see if he would be available. Unfortunately, he was unavailable for this. So uh, when you saw on our website that we were going to be doing this and, and uh, volunteered to come on, I really do appreciate you taking your time to do this. Uh, this is kind of a little bit different way than what we normally do it. But our last book, our last uh, month's book, was the book Unbelievable by Justin Brierley. And uh, he came on and we did an interview with him about his book. And then I noticed that you were also uh, on uh, the, the radio program, Unbelievable, with Justin Browley and with Bart Ehrman. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Oh, that was fun. So uh, I was approached very shortly before the date for filming and told, uh, we need somebody to come on a across from Bart. Bart's going to be in London, so he's going to be in studio. Would you do it? And without stopping to think about the time zones, I said, yes. Then it turned out that they wanted to do it at lunchtime in London, which meant that I was up at 7 a.m. in my office trying desperately to get some caffeine inside of myself. And uh, of course, there's a delay that's induced when you're uh, doing something transatlantically. So uh, that was a real disadvantage, a double disadvantage, not being in the studio and also uh, taking about a half hour to wake up because that's about how long it takes caffeine to hit the system. Uh, so, but it all said it was a two hour discussion and it was aired over two segments on Unbelievable. And I, I thought that it was a, a very interesting time. I tried not to let Bart get away with some of the things that he has gotten away with in some of his other debates. Um, but there's still, there's so much that he'll pull. Uh, he's very fast on his feet, and he'll say something false and then dodge immediately to a different topic before you have a chance to draw breath and say something. And when you're not in the studio with him, that just makes it very hard to catch up with him. So after the debate, we went over the audio transcripts and combed through them very carefully. You'll find on my wife's blog there's a two-part fisking of the many, many, many claims that he made that just won't stand up. And some of them are similar to some things that he says in this book. Um, so I, I was able to catch him on some things, but there's there's much more that I just couldn't do on the hoof. Yeah, have you found in, in his uh, scholarly works that that maybe it it um, uh, it does come across with a a little more care in what he's talking about as far as not making blanket statements and uh, and and yeah, I, hyperbole I, I'm almost. Yeah, illustrate that. Yeah, yeah I, I think that he makes very confident statements to a lay audience who he thinks won't double check what's going on. But when he's writing for a professional audience, he is somewhat more circumspect, although he's, I think, still makes some insupportable claims. But he realizes they'll be viewing what he does with a little bit more precision and care. Well, to be so fair, fewer of these things. Yeah, to be fair, Sorry. a lay Christian audience often does the same thing, makes blanket statements that they can't, you know, they can't fully support. Uh, and uh, so, oh, absolutely. you know, it, it maybe it's a different kind of venue, uh, different kind of milieu to try to have that kind of give and take. Absolutely, but they're not generally the ones who are laughing all the way to the bank with New York Times bestsellers. So he is popular, is, and you know, yes, uh, yeah. Jesus, uh, the, the misquoting Jesus, I think, was the, his uh, book that really put him on the map. Yeah. Yes. Well, if it makes you feel a little bit better, when we interviewed Justin Briley, it was close to midnight his time. So maybe we got a little <laughs> bit of a payback on that. <laughs> oh, there is poetic justice. Thank you for telling me that. That's great. Um, and, and happy birthday recently to Justin as well, but, but that pleases me in some kind of sense that maybe I shouldn't investigate too closely. Well, it is, it is a big disadvantage when you have one guest in the studio and the other one remote, and so I, I, I've done that yeah. before and know, know that uh, uh, handicap. But tell me about, if, and we don't have time to get into a, a real depth, but if you can give me just one or two examples of, of statements that maybe, uh, to be honest with you, as I'm reading the book, he's making some statements, wow, that really is something to take a closer look at. So can you give me an example of what maybe looks, you know, pretty substantial, but when you really dig in, it maybe is not so much? Sure, let me pick two or three. So I am working here from a Harper One paperback edition of the book, and I'll give the page numbers for that, but there are some other editions. Page numbers may not exactly match with the edition you have if you've got a different one. Um, let's look 
at something right out of the first chapter here. Uh, Bart likes to tell us that once you start reading the Gospels carefully, you notice all kinds of contradictions. So here's one that I think is his own. Uh, he's very fond of I'll read this. It's on pages 8 and 9 as I have it in my edition. Here's Bart. For example, in John's Gospel, Jesus performs his first miracle in chapter 2 when he turns the water into wine, a favorite miracle story on college campuses. And we're told that, quote, this was the first sign that Jesus did, close quote, John 2, 11. Later in that chapter, we're told that Jesus did, quote, many signs, close quote, in Jerusalem, John 2, 23. And then in chapter 4, he heals the son of a centurion, and the author says, quote, this was the second sign that Jesus did, close quote, John 4, 54. Huh? One sign? Many signs? And then the second sign? Okay, so good for a laugh, right? Can't John count? How funny is that? Well, what happens if you open up a Bible and you read it for yourself? Let's just do that. I've got a copy of the New Testament here. Let's go to John chapter 2 and look it up for ourselves. And what you'll discover is that he's very, very carefully trimmed these quotations. So he cites John 2, 11. Let's see that. This is the first of his signs. In Cana, Galilee. Notice. Bart's trimmed it out before the mention of Galilee. Talks about John 2, 23 where Jesus does many things, and he says correctly that these things are done in Jerusalem. Pro tip, Jerusalem is not in Galilee. Now, when we move over to John 4.54, what do we find here? Now, this was also the second sign Jesus performed after he came from Judea to Galilee. Ah, but that mention of Galilee also, Bart has trimmed out of the quotation, leaving you with the impression that John can't count when if you read both of these passages in context, it is perfectly obvious that John is counting the signs that Jesus did in Galilee, the first in Galilee, the second in Galilee. That, not to put too fine a point on it, is dishonesty in a writer. He has deliberately trimmed the quotation so as not to alert his reader to something that would have totally eliminated the appearance of any problem or contradiction in the narrative if he had given you the complete quotation. And that, unfortunately, is Bart's M.O. for an awful lot of things. Thank you.